During the early 1920s, the world was mesmerized by King Tut. A British archaeologist, Howard Carter, discovered the young pharaoh's tomb in Egypt's Valley of the Kings, 1922. But the public wasn't only interested in gold and jewelry. The press wrote about the curse of the pharaohs. But was it true? Was an ancient curse really the reason everyone entering the pyramids lost their lives? At the time, this was the only explanation for a series of unexplained passings. The man present at the opening of King Tut's burial chamber, George Herbert V, Earl of Carnarvon, lived only five more months after the discovery. He had also sponsored the dig. In comes Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. You probably know of him, the English writer behind Sherlock Holmes. He claimed that an evil elemental caused the explorer's demise. He must have been joking, right? Unfortunately, no. The newspapers continued to blame the pharaoh's curse after every Egyptologist left this world. These are the scientists who study the ancient cultures of Egypt. The archaeologist who opened King Tutankhamun's tomb passed away full 17 years after the discovery. The reason for it wasn't a secret, Hodgkin's disease. Yet again, journalists around the world wrote of a curse. This was getting ridiculous. But science must have had a rational explanation, right? Well, it did. And that explanation was common mold. Harmful fungi, Aspergillus, can survive for ages in sealed tombs. When humans inhale them, there's a high risk of infection in people who have a weakened immune system. Today, doctors believe this is what happened to the unfortunate explorer more than a century ago. Scientists now know that this type of fungi grows especially well on grain. And King Tut's tomb was full of offerings in the form of baskets full of raw grain and bread. Researchers discovered other varieties of fungi on ancient Egyptian mummies. These molds can easily cause some nasty consequences for humans. The danger of rotting organic material is real. Just look inside your fridge. Any food leftovers you have there start to go off after just three to four days. You can imagine what happens to food in a sealed chamber after thousands of years. Food is just one kind of organic material. There is also wood. If you expose it to water or even moisture in the air, it starts to deteriorate. You don't have to travel to Egypt to see the effects of this process. Any abandoned building in your neighborhood can serve as an example. When a piece of wood gets wet and has no way of drying out, there is going to be damage. From fungi to wood-boring insects, the list is long. Rotten wood presents a huge structural issue. Beams and floor panels are all made of timber, so you better not go inside a failing building. You can easily lose your footing. But this is just the tip of the iceberg. The building materials since the time of the pharaohs have changed, but so have the dangers. One of the best examples is asbestos. Until the 1970s, most home insulation materials contained this substance. It was in everything, from boilers to soundproofing. This microfiber provided excellent heat insulation. But then, the United States banned asbestos in 1989. The UK did the same a decade later. The reason for it is that asbestos becomes a health hazard when it gets damaged. When humans inhale asbestos fibers, they can get seriously sick. Abandoned strictures are full of this material, and there is no one to maintain them. You see the danger now. Another material is also common in old buildings, lead. Ancient Romans used lead piping to channel spring water into their homes. They also cooked in lead vessels, which was probably not the wisest of choices. You see, lead and water don't go well together because of something called corrosion. But this problem isn't ancient. US officials banned lead piping only in 1986. That means that 7% of American households still have lead service lines. And this is not the only source of poisoning. Until the mid-1960s, builders used lead paint to coat woodwork. In abandoned buildings, this lead coating snapped a long time ago. Anyone who touches doors and windows will disturb this lead dust and inhale it. The dust particles are at least visible to an unaided eye. This is not the case for carbon monoxide. This gas has no color, so you can't see it. It has no odor, so you can't smell it. No way to detect a carbon monoxide leak at all. And how does this dangerous gas usually escape? Poor maintenance. Well, abandoned buildings have zero maintenance. One second, you could be exploring an old factory, and the next you could feel dizzy with and have a terrible headache. These are just some of the symptoms of CO poisoning, the less severe ones. But what is the source? 
All it takes is for an old boiler to finally give way after years of neglect. We've reached an important question. What is the main factor in air quality inside a room? If you are thinking the level of oxygen, try again. It turns out that oxygen levels drop by only 0.3% in 8 hours inside an airtight room. This is a room in which doors and windows are sealed with tape. So, the decrease is even smaller in normal conditions. Oxygen isn't the main problem. The levels of carbon dioxide rise sharply inside a sealed room. This is the direct result of human breathing. We inhale oxygen and exhale CO2. Think of it as a waste gas. Normally it's only a tiny portion of the air we breathe 0.04%. But in a sealed room, high levels of carbon dioxide will make you feel drowsy. And that's the last thing you need when inside a dilapidated building. Carbon dioxide will decrease your ability to think clearly. Researchers from Harvard did an interesting study in 2016. They had office workers come in six days in a row to complete a problem-solving test. During the week, they gradually raised the carbon dioxide levels in the mock-up office. The results of the same test kept getting worse over time. There are many factors at play, but CO2 levels definitely had an impact on the workers' problem-solving ability. The test took place inside a typical office environment, not inside a crumbling building where visitors must watch their every step. When I say visitors, I really mean trespassers. And trespassing is a criminal offense in the United States. This goes both for private and public property. If you defy the law, you can be fined up to $5,000 or even face lockup time. That should make you think twice before jumping over a fence with a no trespassing sign. But again, you might not be the only one inside. You can never know who else is in the building. Perhaps a person up to no good? It doesn't have to be a person at all. Animals can pose a threat as well. You would be startled if you saw a rat, for example. But the poor animal would be scared as well. It might bite you. The list of diseases rats carry is pretty long. But rodents' teeth can cause other forms of damage. They grow constantly, so the animal has to constantly nibble on something to stop them from overgrowing. If you ever felt peckish at 1 a.m., you know the feeling. Electric cables are high on the rodent's menu. Abandoned buildings have plenty of those. Old wiring is dangerous on its own. Structures erected before 1984 often used wires made out of aluminum. Today, copper is the standard because an aluminum wire is 55 times more likely to catch on fire than a copper one. Flipping a switch in a rundown building can cost you your life. Be on alert for telltale signs that something is wrong. Lights that flicker, sparks from sockets, and the smell of smoke. And yeah, don't count on an earth cable to protect you from electrocution. Ground cables became standard only in the 1960s. The Great Pyramid was created as the final resting place of ancient Egyptian monarch Khufu. According to legend, French leader Napoleon entered the Great Pyramid and came back out looking shaken and super pale. He never revealed what he saw inside, but whatever it was is said to have affected him for the rest of his life. When Napoleon entered the pyramid, he would have walked through a super tight and ascending passageway. He'd then go through another passageway, known as the Great Chamber. This corridor would have been much taller than the previous one, and would have cobbles too. He then reached the King's Chamber, the centerpiece of the Great Pyramid, which was lined with huge blocks of granite but it wouldn't have looked as grand as we might imagine. There are no hieroglyphics decorating its walls, as Egyptians only began decorating the burial chambers of pyramids much later on. The pharaoh's tombs deep inside the pyramid would have also been filled with treasures, from chunks of gold to the world's most expensive jewelry. But this would have all been looted a long time ago. The only thing that probably would have been left in there would have been a huge sarcophagus which would have once contained the king's mummy. He'd also have to walk past the queen's chamber. This room most likely didn't hold any queens though, as pyramids were usually only built for one person. There are mysterious tunnels leading from here. To this day, no one is really sure what they're there for. And that's not the only mysterious and creepy thing Napoleon may have encountered, as stories of pharaohs leaving ancient curses on pyramids go way back. Many pyramids had warnings written on the outside, telling of horrifying things that would happen to those who entered and disturbed the peace. 
We might not know what exactly Napoleon found in the Great Pyramid that scared him so much, but we know for sure what was found in Tutankhamun's tomb. Tutankhamun was an ancient Egyptian pharaoh who was only eight or nine years old when he took to the throne. He became a cultural phenomenon when his tomb was discovered almost completely intact in 1922. His pyramid sits in the Valley of Kings in Thebes, modern Luxor, which is in Egypt. Unlike the Great Pyramid, Tutankhamun's tomb was covered in beautiful wall decorations. The walls told the story of how he would travel to the afterlife through the underworld. Egyptians believed all people would have to take this journey, so they would fill their tombs with objects and paintings to help them get there. There'd also be spells painted on the walls. They believed this would help people pass over to the next realm. The journey would be pretty long, and for that reason, the ancient Egyptians would also fill the pyramids with food. Tutankhamun's pyramid was filled with eight fruit baskets. They even found something called gingerbread fruit in there. The rooms were jam-packed with furniture, statues, clothes, and staffs, amongst a whole bunch of other things. You'd likely find a lot of clothes and expensive jewelry in the pyramids as well. The ancient Egyptians wanted their ancestors to travel in style to the afterlife. They put Tutankhamun in his final resting place with over 50 pieces of clothing, all of the highest quality. There were tunics, scarves, gloves and headdresses, and a ton of jewelry. Bracelets, pennants, necklaces, rings, and scarabs for protection were all found inside. Each of them was made of gold or precious stones. There were also fans made of ostrich feathers to keep the old pharaoh cool in the hot Egyptian sun. But the temperature inside the pyramids never actually went above 68 degrees Fahrenheit. The ancient Egyptians developed a super cool air conditioning system that we don't fully understand even today. Tutankhamun's pyramid also contained 130 walking sticks made from ebony, ivory, silver, and gold to help him on his journey. There were three chariots hidden away in case he got tired of all the walking. They also put 11 boat paddles inside, but there was no sign of any boat. The pyramids would be littered with the pharaoh's favorite scents and perfumes. During the excavation of Tutankhamun's pyramid, it quickly became clear that it had been robbed during ancient times. There was damage to doors and traces of oils left in empty jars. It looks like someone raided the pyramid for gold and the scents, perfumes, and oils that had been left for King Tut. There was still a bit of perfume, which was made from coconut oil and frankincense, left in one bottle. It seems like Pharaoh Tutankhamun loved board games. There was an ivory traveling set of Senet in his pyramid. Although we don't know for sure exactly how to play it, we have figured out it was sort of an ancient Egyptian version of backgammon. It looks like it was a two-player game where the goal was to knock your opponent off the board. Not really sure who Tutankhamun's mummy was supposed to play with, though. The ancient Egyptians had some rituals that may seem pretty strange to us. For example, they used to shave their eyebrows off if they ever lost a cat. So it's not too surprising they put some really weird things inside pyramids. Archaeologists discovered a collection of mummified cats and scarab beetles in pyramids that date back more than 4,000 years. They were found in the pyramids of Saqqara, which is south of Cairo. They also found a bunch of makeup kits and mirrors inside. Makeup was worn proudly by both men and women in ancient Egyptian times. Eyeliner was the most popular cosmetic. The Rosetta Stone was one of the best discoveries ever made in pyramids. It was found by our man Napoleon Bonaparte and his team. It's a black granite rock that dates back to 196 BCE. It's transcribed in Greek, Demotic, and Hieroglyphic. When it was translated in 1822, we got the key to understanding ancient Egyptian hieroglyphics for the very first time. The discovery of Queen Hatshepsut's mummy in 1903 changed our understanding of the Egyptians forever. After she had passed away, her successor, Satmusi III, removed most of the evidence of her reign. So we basically knew nothing about Egypt's first great female leader. She's now gone on to become one of the few and most famous female pharaohs of Egypt. Pharaoh Khufu even had a fully-fledged boat in his pyramid. Archaeologists uncovered more than 1,200 pieces of a giant boat near the Great Pyramid at Giza. They reassembled the boat, and it's a whopping 144 feet long. 
It's most likely a solar boat, which was designed to carry the resurrected king with the deity Ra. Fun fact, the Pyramid of Giza is the last remaining of the seven wonders of the ancient world. The other six are the Hanging Gardens, the Colossus, the Temple of Artemis, the Mausoleum, the Lighthouse, and the Statue of Zeus. This pyramid was also the world's tallest man-made structure for 3,800 years, and it's the biggest pyramid in Egypt. It took a staggering 2.3 million blocks of limestone, and some weighed as much as 80 tons. It took an incredible 100,000 laborers and a whopping 23 years to build. Its original height was a mega 480 feet. In 2017, archaeologists discovered something weird about Egypt's Great Pyramid. There's a hidden void that's at least 100 feet long, and no one really knows why it's there or what's actually inside it. The weird void is the first inner structure discovered within the 4,500-year-old pyramid since the 1800s. Scientists used cosmic rays to detect the massive hole, but are still no closer today to finding out what's inside. The ancient Egyptians took a lot of care building the pyramids, and everything was strategically placed and structurally sound, so it's super unlikely that this hole is due to blocks falling over time. Loads of pyramids also contain small model figurines called Ushabti. These represented attendants. They believed they would come to life to serve the pharaohs in the afterlife. But it's amazing that all this stuff actually fit inside. There isn't actually a huge amount of space inside the structures. It's mostly just rock. Two centuries ago, a 31-year-old Frenchman stormed into his brother's office in Paris. He had only one thing to share. I've got it! The man was so excited that he immediately collapsed. He spent the next five days in bed recovering his health. Who was this mysterious person and why was he so thrilled? Jean-Francois Champollion made one of the greatest scientific breakthroughs in human history. He had cracked the code of Egyptian hieroglyphs. This enabled scientists to finally unravel the secrets of this ancient civilization. They weren't able to read hieroglyphs for nearly 2,000 years. After the Romans took over Egypt, the intricate writing system slowly faded away from people's minds. The last of the hieroglyphic texts date back to the 4th century. For thousands of years, Egyptians used images to show their lives. But the knowledge of how to read these pictures was lost to modern science. The story of hieroglyphs began in 3250 before current era. That's when ancient Egyptians developed writing. Their motivation was to better organize the distribution and storage of goods. One of the earliest examples is a ceramic jar that had an inscription in black ink. There were two major writing systems. The first were the hieroglyphs which literally means sacred carving. Egyptians carved hieroglyphs in stone on temples, tombs, and similar monuments for 3,000 years. They present a system of pictorial texts. A pictograph is a picture or a drawing that stands for an idea of a word. It's a precursor to the true writing as we have it today. For example, when Egyptians wanted to write ibis, they would draw a small image of the bird. Hieroglyphs can be found on walls. They were a formal way of writing. The other writing system was hieratic. Egyptians mostly used it when writing on papyrus. That's an early, thicker form of the paper we have today. It soon evolved into demotic. This improved version became the most common writing systems in ancient Egypt. Then, in the early 4th century BCE, Alexander the Great took control of Egypt. This was the time when the Greek Ptolemaic dynasty ruled the country. You've probably heard of the last ruler of this dynasty, Cleopatra. During her time, Egyptian Demotic and Greek were used side by side. The two started mixing, and by the year 100, a new language emerged, Coptic. It slowly replaced the ancient writing system, only Egyptian priests used hieroglyphs for the next couple of centuries, and then their meaning was lost to history. But not forever. 
Arabs were the first who tried to solve the mystery of the hieroglyphs. Medieval travelers came across these strange symbols and wanted to understand their meaning. They consulted speakers of Coptic and translated texts from Greek and Latin into Arabic to break the code of the hieroglyphs. During the Renaissance, Europeans also became fascinated with the legacy of ancient Egypt. Scholars from the Old Continent believed that hieroglyphs were a group of symbols as opposed to a written language. This was all about to change in 1799. A year earlier, Napoleon, the famous French ruler, arrived in Egypt. His subordinates constructed a fort that dated back to the 15th century. Rashid, or Rosetta, was a port town in the northeast of Egypt, near Alexandria. One section of the old fortification wall contained an interesting slab inside. The stone tablet was made of a granite-like rock. It was just 40 inches high and 30 inches wide. It contained three distinctive sections of text carved into it. The letters were in three scripts and two languages, hieroglyphs, Demotic, and Greek. It was a fragment of a larger ancient stella. These are upright stone slabs that are used to dedicate to a person or an event, but the one from Rosetta was damaged. Two-thirds of the hieroglyphic text on the top was missing. The bottom Greek text lacked a cornerstone. The only fully preserved section was the writing in Demotic in the middle of the slab. It eventually ended up in the British Museum. The scientific community was intrigued, and the race was on to decipher it. Prints and casts of the slab went out all over Europe. Scholars already knew ancient Greek, so in theory, this shouldn't have been so hard. The first people who saw the Rosetta Stone thought the process would take two weeks. In the end, it took two decades. The main issue was the fact that hieroglyphs and spoken ancient Egyptian didn't have a connection anymore. Scientists didn't know what sounds the letters on the slab corresponded to. Imagine if English disappeared a thousand years in the future. Then someone finds a tablet with the word dog. At first, they wouldn't know how to read the word or the individual letters. Even if they figured out how to pronounce the word, they wouldn't know its meaning. This is what linguists were dealing with in the case of the Rosetta Stone. The careful study of the artifact produced another find. The texts weren't direct translations of each other. They both described the same event, but in different words. It was like you saw a movie with two friends, and then all three of you wrote different reviews about it. The original text was probably in Greek, but the translators added extra words to make it sound more Egyptian. An English physician and physicist, Thomas Young, made the first great breakthrough. He knew that the name Ptolemy appeared several times in the text based on the Greek translation. This wasn't an Egyptian name, so it was impossible to represent it with a single image. The only way to spell out this Greek name was to use symbols that sound like it when produced. This is called transliteration, and we have it today as well. This is how foreign-sounding words are written down in Chinese or some Slavic languages. Young focused on sets of hieroglyphs in oval frames. These are called cartouches. He experimented a bit but finally discovered that one of them read Ptolemy the Great. The individual hieroglyphs that made up this name corresponded to sounds needed to produce it. This is where our mysterious man from the beginning of the video enters the picture. Champollion picked up where Young left off. He knew Coptic, so the Frenchman was able to determine what many other hieroglyphs sounded like. The Eureka moment was close. It came while he was studying a cartouche from a site dedicated to Ramses II. It had four symbols. The last two were the same. He determined this was the sound S. The first symbol was the sun. This is Ra or Re in Coptic. So the cartouche read Ra something SS. Can you already guess the name? Of course, it's Ramses. This breakthrough finally cracked the code. 
Ancient Egyptian wasn't a mishmash of cool-looking images. It was a phonetic language that Jean-Francois Champollion discovered in September of 1822. The stone slab is today known as the Decree of Memphis. The Egyptian council issued it in this city in the year 196 before current era. In it, they expressed their loyalty to the pharaoh. They erected identical stelae and temples all across Egypt. The Rosetta Stone was just one copy of them, but its content is less important than the fact that Champollion's translation gave these ancient peoples their voice again. During the 1800s, European scholars didn't think that the Egyptian civilization was much older than Classical Greek or Roman. Now that scientists could read hieroglyphs, a whole new chapter of human history opened. One of the most famous finds in the history of archaeology happened in 1922. That's when the British archaeologist Howard Carter discovered the tomb of Pharaoh Tutankhamun in Egypt's Valley of the Kings. The whole world admired King Tut's golden mask. But without Champollion's pioneering work, it would be impossible to know who its owner was. The young pharaoh's cartouche is phonetic. For instance, you pronounce the pictograph of a chick as the vowel U. The symbol for the key of life is an ank, and there is a shepherd's crook in the end. It symbolizes the word ruler. When you hear the word mummy, you might get a chill down your spine. That's because most of us associate this word with those creepy characters we've seen in some scary movies. But in reality, mummies have helped us understand a lot about ancient civilizations, their rulers, and about how people used to deal with losing their loved ones. The people most famous worldwide for their mummies are the ancient Egyptians. They believed that some sort of existence after passing away was possible, if certain conditions were met. That's why they insisted on preserving the human body through the process of mummification and placing the mummy in a furnished tomb, kind of like giving it a fully functioning apartment of its own. Why did they believe in this? Well, because they were deeply connected to their natural environment for the most part. They saw the natural cycles around them, like how the sun rose every day, followed by the moon, or how new life was always sprouting from plants, even after they had wilted away. They also believed that the powerful spirit Osiris, who represented the cycle of passing away and resurrection, played a role in this process. To prepare for the afterlife, the ancient Egyptians followed certain rituals, like mummification, which involved using materials like honey, resins, and incense to preserve the body. There's no other mummy more popular than that of King Tut. He was a young pharaoh who ruled over 3,000 years ago in Egypt. The problem with discovering ancient royal tombs is that most of such burial sites were previously robbed. People knew ancient rulers had been left with many valuable belongings, so those locations became vulnerable to thieves. When King Tut's tomb was opened in 1922, people were excited because it had not been robbed, like many other previously discovered royal tombs. That's how well hidden it was. Inside, his mummy was encapsulated in a total of three coffins, including one made of gold. The objects found in his tomb showed us what ancient Egypt was like. And studying his mummy also helped us learn about the culture and practices popular at the time when he passed away. We also learned about his family by looking at his DNA. Scientists were able to discover that he had had a disease called malaria and a problem with his foot that might have made it hard for him to walk. Ramses II was another pharaoh in Egypt who ruled for 68 years, which was quite a lot back in the day. He was known for his expansion campaigns and building projects. Many objects from his time as a ruler still exist today, including a large statue of him. Ramses II was about six feet tall and lived to be about 90 years old. After looking at his mummy, scientists concluded that he may have had a medical condition that affected his spine. Now, remember those thieves I mentioned before? 
They are probably the reason why Ramses II ended up in a plain coffin in a secret collection of royal mummies at Deir al-Bahari, which was rediscovered in 1881. Thankfully, archaeologists were able to identify him because his journeys had been recorded on his wrappings. The process was really tedious too. In fact, in ancient Egypt, the mummification process could take a staggering 70 days to complete. A special person would say a very specific speech while delicately handling the body and drying it out using a type of salt called natron. They also used linen and resin to make the body look more lifelike and to wrap it in cloth. The tomb was equally as important for ancient Egyptians. The walls of King Tut's tomb, for example, were adorned with intricate artwork that depicted his journey to the afterlife, from his burial procession to his passage through the underworld. The ancient Egyptians believed that everyone made this journey after passing away, and they filled their tombs with items and paintings to help the person in their spiritual travels. Additionally, the walls of the tomb were decorated with spells from a special book, which contained a collection of poems that the Egyptians believed would help people reach the afterlife. And speaking of how important this journey was, people also placed food in these ancient tombs. In King Tut's tomb, archaeologists discovered 36 jars of vintage beverages and eight baskets of fruit, which were believed to be left there to help him in his journey to the afterlife. The Egyptians believed that traveling to the afterlife took a really long time. So they left a lot of supplies, such as food and water, to sustain their loved ones. Pharaohs also generally had numerous luxurious garments and beautiful jewelry in their tombs to ensure that they would have a fashionable journey. These items included various types of linen clothing, such as tunics, scarves, gloves, and headdresses, as well as a lot of gold jewelry with precious stones, like bracelets, buckles, pennants, necklaces, rings, and even precious depictions of insects for protection. Some were also deposited with fans made from ivory and ostrich feathers to keep them cool in the afterlife. Some ancient rulers were even placed in their forever apartments along with boats. For example, Pharaoh Khufu built the Great Pyramid at Giza as his tomb, and a large ship was found inside. King Tut, however, was buried with multiple boat paddles, but no actual boat. Instead, he had three chariots and numerous walking sticks made of precious materials, perhaps indicating he'd rather travel to the beyond by land, not by water. Amongst the most interesting objects found near ancient mummies are bottles of oils and perfumes. If rulers were supposed to be fashionable, why not smell nice too, right? Also, some of them had some ancient kinds of board games, most of them made out of precious materials, like gold or ivory. One of those games was called Senate. It was very popular amongst the ancient Egyptians and very similar to modern-day chess. The ancient Egyptians may have the most famous mummies out there, but they weren't the first to invent the procedure. In fact, it all started in South America with an ancient civilization named the Chinchorro. As far as we know today, these people were the first to mummify their loved ones that had passed away. They did it somewhere around 2,000 years before the Egyptians started their own rituals. Sure, we can tell a lot about ancient rulers by studying these mummies, but until recently, we had no idea what they really looked like during their lifetime. Not so long ago, though, some very special mummy paintings were found by archaeologists studying ancient Egyptian objects. These mummy portraits are highly detailed paintings of individuals that were made while they were still alive. Such paintings were often painted on wood, as opposed to the classical portraits we all know about, which are painted on canvas. They are known for their realism and beauty, and have even been used by researchers to diagnose diseases by comparing them to the corresponding mummies. Some of these portraits also include depictions of jewelry, which was later found on the mummies. The recent discovery of these mummy portraits in central Egypt is significant, as it marks the first time in over a century that such paintings have been found. Mummies appeared all around the world naturally, too. Mummification can occur without people intervening because of natural conditions, like extremely cold or hot environments, places with a lack of oxygen, 
or accidental exposure to chemicals that preserve the body. These conditions don't allow bacteria to grow, resulting in the body remaining more or less intact. Famous Otzi was one of these mummies. We know today he was a man who lived around 5,000 years ago in Europe. But upon his discovery in the Alps in 1991, Austrian authorities initially believed that he was a modern mountaineer because of how well preserved the body was. However, after the Iceman was removed from the glacier, it was determined that he was actually from the Copper Age. You hear the word Paris, and a picture of the Eiffel Tower comes straight into your mind. Or croissants. Or maybe you imagine going on a romantic stroll in the city of love. Or croissants. But not many know that right below the bustling city of Paris, there is a series of underground passages, the catacombs. They're home to the remains of more than 6 million people. Whoa! But it wasn't always like that. Paris used to be a vast swamp. It was because most of the city was submerged in water at one time. Due to this, once the areas rose to the surface, the ground became rich in minerals, the most important being limestone. To extract it and use it to develop Paris, underground mines were dug up somewhere around the 14th century. They were dug horizontally to prevent collapse and to deal with the weight of the ceiling. Most of these mines were set up on the right side of the River Seine. Soon, Paris started expanding beyond its old city walls. Here's where it got tricky. The city started building on top of the land where they had dug all those tunnels. This caused some big problems, like the ground collapsing. In 1774, one of the roads in the suburbs collapsed about 100 feet into the ground. Due to rising safety concerns, officials decided to abandon the mines. The quarries were checked, and the tunnels were renovated to avoid future disasters. The bones ended up in the tunnels because of another major problem Paris faced a few years later. The growing population of the city caused an increase in the number of bodies. Cemeteries became overcrowded. And the city was actually so bad that, at one point, bodies could not be taken care of properly. They started to rot and spread harmful bacteria. So those who were in charge of Paris got an idea. They picked a new spot that was like a secret hideout for bones, one of the old mines. The process of moving the bones from cemeteries to the tunnel started in the late 1780s. They began with the biggest cemetery in Paris, the saint Innocent Cemetery. They didn't want to scare people, so they moved the bones at night. The remains went into two big holes in the ground and then got stacked in the tunnels by the quarry workers. They continued moving the bones until Paris developed into a city in the 1860s. The official name given to the collection of mines turned cemetery was the Paris Municipal Ossuary. But this name never became popular, and the tunnels instead became known as the catacombs. While the bones were still being added to the collection, the officials saw fit to open the place for public viewing in the year 1809. Tourists had to make a prior appointment and sign a guest book. As time passed, famous people started visiting, including the future King Charles X, Austrian Emperor Francis I, and Napoleon III. Of course, the rules for visiting have been changing over time. But now the catacombs, also known as the ossuary of Denferrochenro, have become a famous tourist spot. Around 5 million people come to explore it every year. What drives them? Well, in addition to the creepy but rich history, the catacombs are also considered one of the most haunted places on Earth. And there are several unsolved mysteries surrounding them. Some years back, a camcorder was discovered in the catacombs with a bit of footage. ABC Family showed the video in their documentary. In the clip, you can see a man very deep inside the catacombs, exploring alone. The video is from his point of view, and he sees something strange. He runs away terrified and eventually drops his camera. What happened to this man is still unknown. He was never found or identified. There were also reports of people getting lost in the catacombs, the most famous being a doorkeeper who got lost in 1793. His body was found 11 years later near an exit. How he passed away remains a mystery. There are also some not-so-eerie but equally strange mysteries surrounding the catacombs. There are people who like exploring the tunnels on their own. They're known as cataphiles. 
These people go into the quarries that have been abandoned to the public and long forgotten. Some explorers discovered secret water pools in the abandoned areas, and people would go to take a dip there. In 2004, police patrolling an unexplored area came across a 5,300-square-foot cavern with a movie theater. There was a screen, projection equipment, some classic movies, and even chairs. There was also a restaurant-like setting nearby, three telephone lines, and, well, electricity, which hinted that a group of people had been living there or regularly visiting. But when the police came back three days later with experts to find the source of the electricity, they found that the wire had been cut off. Only a note was left behind. Do not try to find us. Such enthusiasts existed in the past, too. Once, a Parisian farmer did the same and came across button mushrooms growing in the catacombs. He saw an opportunity to make easy money, and he actually created mushroom farms in the tunnels. He even got official permission for it. By 1950, a hundred farmers had been working inside growing mushrooms. There's also a scary legend about the catacombs that some people believe in. According to it, at midnight, unexplainable voices can be heard in the catacombs. They try to convince people to go further inside the catacombs until they can't find their way out. There's no strong evidence whether this story is true or not, but thinking about it is still scary. Due to safety issues, today, only a small part of the catacombs can be legally toured by the public, less than 2 miles, while the catacombs go on for 200 miles. And still, the tour is an hour long, and it perfectly captures what's worth seeing. Solo traveling is extremely dangerous, as there is the possibility of getting lost. Mm, no thanks. In 2017, two teenagers entered the system through a secret passage. They were found three days later and had to be treated for hypothermia. The tunnels, damp and old, have an average temperature of 59 degrees Fahrenheit. Keep in mind that the entrance alone is uncomfortable enough to turn some people away. To get inside, you have to go down a winding staircase that takes you a little more than 65 feet below the surface. In the beginning, you find yourself in a well-lit room filled with interesting information and displays. But as you move forward, the place gets eerily silent. You pass through a creepy entrance that boldly declares this in French, which when translated English is something like, stop, this is the empire of doom. It's not exactly a warm welcome, and that's because the Paris catacombs are known for their haunted reputation. As you move deeper, the sounds of the world above fade away, and soon you are surrounded by the silence of the earth below. The bones themselves are placed strategically, almost in artistic patterns. This was the idea of a man who was once in charge of the place. He turned the bones into a kind of underground museum with cool structures like columns, plaques, altars, and even some weirdly shaped forms that some people consider art. Popular all year round, the catacombs become particularly loaded around Halloween. People organize special parties or events near the place too. But the most bizarre thing was offered by the catacombs themselves through Airbnb. The famous rental service allowed two guests to sleep in the catacombs. They were offered a bed for Halloween night and breakfast. Upon checking in, they were told tales in the history of the catacombs. This way, they went to bed fully aware of the fact that they were sleeping among the remains of 6 million people. Yes, it remains to be seen. It's nighttime, and you're about to walk inside Pharaoh Tutankhamun's final resting place. You know, King Tut. You don't have a torch, but at least you came with a flashlight. You walk down several flights of stairs and observe how the walls are carved in hieroglyphics and what looks like a spell. Those who take anything from this place will be doomed for life, the spell says. Even if you don't really believe it, this scares you a little bit. You find a huge stone door. Is it a trap? You manage to open it, but oh no, it's only an empty chamber. You check your map. It seems like you're heading in the right direction. After what feels like hours, you realize you must be trapped inside a labyrinth. You try to retrace your steps, but you can't find the door where you came in from anymore. That's it, you think to yourself. You've fallen for the pharaoh's trap. What's worse, you didn't bring a lunch.
Ok, so we've all seen Hollywood movies where the main character is exploring ancient ruins and faces some seriously dangerous traps, right? We've been told Egyptian royalty protected their final resting places with venomous scorpions and snakes, sliding doors that will trap you for life, and giant rolling boulders that will crush anyone on their paths. The thing is, were these traps truly real? Well, I regret to be the one to break it to you, but this is all fiction. These elaborate traps were too technologically advanced for ancient civilizations to pull off. That is not to say, however, that there weren't any traps at all. Ancient civilizations, like the Egyptians and the Mayans, are known for their practice of building entire monuments dedicated to the ones who had passed away. These structures would often reflect the position of person occupied in society. So, for the really important people, the VIPs of their times, massive monuments were built to host their bodies long after they were gone. Some of these civilizations believed that a person's life would continue on the other side of the veil. For that reason, a person would be buried together with the belongings of their current life. If they had a lot of money and power and stuff, that meant their resting places would be filled with riches and gold. Now imagine if you lived in ancient Egypt, and you knew exactly where all the pharaoh's tombs were located, and had heard rumors of the amount of wealth kept in these places. Maybe you would be tempted to go check it out, right? We're talking about large rooms filled from floor to ceiling with golden artifacts, jewels, and even money. I mean, it does sound tempting. And since there weren't any security guards protecting the entrance of these places, Egyptians needed to get creative as to how they would protect these riches. These old civilizations found some traps to be useful. A recurring one was building empty rooms inside the monument to confuse a burglar. Now, let's take a look at Amenhotep III's final resting place as an example. It was built in the city of Luxor, in a spot also known as the Western Valley of the Kings. Two French engineers originally discovered the monument between 1905 and 1914 CE. The structure is huge and has more than 10 chambers, connected by long corridors and steep stairways. The king's chamber is the most hidden one, and for an outsider to try and find it, they will probably enter a lot of empty rooms beforehand. Other pharaohs tried to protect their riches by commissioning monuments with false doors concealing pits that were up to 20 feet deep. This way, an unwarned and unwanted visitor would be surprised by the deep hole on their way to the king's resting chamber. Alongside false doors, pharaohs made sure to build labyrinth-style corridors and false walls. This way, robbers could take hours or days before they found the king's real chamber. As to pits with poisonous snakes on them, if there were any reptiles inside these monuments, they probably got inside on their own, and would most likely not stay there for long. There is no way snakes would survive years and years without food inside these pits. So yes, another Hollywood-induced belief right there. If these traps seem boring to you, Archaeologists did find an interesting deterrent in the final resting place of the Red Queen of Palenque in Mexico. Palenque was one of the most powerful Mayan cities in pre-Columbian Mexico, and the Red Queen was believed to be the grandmother of the last Mayan king, undoubtedly a person of immense importance to the empire. In her honor, a huge monument was built to keep her body after her passing. The discovery of the tomb itself was already thrilling. Archaeologists found an ancient monument when digging at the site back in 1994. The first thing they found was a room with a hidden door. Once they opened the door, they discovered a long corridor. Finally, at the end of this corridor was the Queen's Chamber. The team of archaeologists was beyond excited to unearth this chamber with the mummy of the Queen herself still inside it. They found her to be accompanied by her pearls, jade shells, and expensive rocks. But as the team explored the remains, they saw something rather strange. The room was filled with a red-colored powder. Researchers knew that the color red was important to the Mayan people, and that much of their clothing and buildings were decorated with this color. But they didn't understand why the queen was buried with this unknown red substance. 
After they took a sample back with them for further analysis, they discovered that the red powder was cinnabar, a very dangerous mineral. This powder, when inhaled, can cause, shall we say, severe health damage to a person. The team concluded that this could only be a trap for anyone trying to steal her riches. Okay, so dangerous powders might have worked as the most intense traps we've seen until now. But perhaps the cheapest way to keep out unwanted visitors was to advertise spells written out all over the monument. We'd probably laugh at these today, but back in the day, they were more or less effective. Spells usually said that the person who took anything from that place would meet a tragic fate. Some spells said that robbers would lose their houses in big fires or terrible floods. Other spells said burglars would have incurable and undiagnosed health issues, but they weren't really enough to stop people from taking any gold. There are some stories surrounding how these spells might have been real. One of them is from the famous British Egyptologist Howard Carter, the one responsible for unearthing Pharaoh Tutankhamun's resting place in the 1920s. After months of unsuccessful digging, Carter discovered the tomb's existence by chance. He found the entrance to a stairway right beneath the soil where he had been searching all those months. With the help of a team, he cleared the piles of sand blocking the stairs and discovered a doorway. The door had several royal symbols carved into it, and Carter knew this could only mean a very important person had been buried there. And he was right. With a chisel, he made a hole in the top left-hand corner of the doorway and lit his vision with the help of a candle. He couldn't believe what he was seeing – the reflection of several golden and jeweled items crowding the chamber before him. Lost for 3,000 years, Carter had just discovered the final resting place of King Tut. But the story didn't finish here. This discovery was accompanied by a series of unfortunate events that led people to believe it had something to do with the pharaoh's spell. Carter himself mysteriously passed away just a few years later, and some of his assistants lost their houses in floods, just like one of the spells threatened. Some say it's just coincidental, as there's no real proof of these things being connected. Well, what do you think? Was this an effective trap after all? Unlike many other ancient Egyptian burial grounds, King Tutankhamun's tomb stayed hidden and free of unwanted thieves for 3,000 years. One reason was that the tomb was smaller than average and tucked away in a place called the Valley of the Kings. This area was already being extensively explored by the time they stumbled upon Tut Spot. The entrance was all covered in debris from building a nearby tomb, which must have also helped keep it a secret. There were also zero writings or signs on the outside of the tomb. Time passing also played a part in keeping it in amazing shape until the 1920s, when a man named Howard Carter finally made it in. But was Carter that big of a hero? Some recent findings say he might have been sneakier than initially thought. People used to think Carter wasn't just a glorified treasure hunter, he was a true archaeologist. Before Tut, he had been on a relentless quest for Egyptian artifacts. He discovered his interest in these unusual objects when he was a child, and soon started drawing the sculptures and inscriptions that were found in ancient tombs. After stumbling upon the remains of King Tut, Carter spent a decade recording and processing all sorts of objects like golden thrones, chariots, and statues from Tut's tomb, shipping them down the Nile to Egypt's museum in Cairo. Well, at least, that was the official story. More recent discoveries claim that not all of the objects made it to Egyptian officials. A secret letter seems to uncover Carter's little 10 for them, one for me policy. The letter in question was sent to Sir Alan Gardner, a philologist and friend of Carter's, dated from 1922. In these writings, Carter mentioned having found the tomb and was asking his buddy for some advice. In another letter from 1934, Gardner seems to be thanking Carter for an amulet, which was sent to him as a thank you gift. Carter was adamant that it didn't come from Tut's tomb, but evidently, it did. Even the British director of the Egyptian Museum was on to Carter's sneaky endeavors, but couldn't prove it. 
he compared Gardner's amulet to others from Tut's tomb, and lo and behold, they were a perfect match. Gardner was so disappointed to have been put in such a sticky situation that he vented to Carter in another letter. Deciding to be a good friend, Gardner didn't throw the famous archaeologist under the bus. Instead, he advised Carter to take those stolen goods back to Cairo. Just like he'd advise you to like this video and subscribe to the Brightside channel for more amazing videos on the most unique topics in history. It's not the only shady piece of information on Carter's post-discovery behavior. In 1947, a man named Alfred Lucas, who used to work with a controversial archaeologist, gave some information in an obscure journal in Cairo. He claimed that Carter sneakily cracked open the burial chamber door himself. Then he sealed it back up like nothing had happened before the official uncovering. Now why would he do that? Well, the same theory suggests that Carter and his crew might have entered the tomb early so they could get their hands on some ancient goodies. Obviously, these people couldn't risk having such objects sold while they were still alive, but made sure they were auctioned off after they passed. Carter, though, never confessed to anything. He made no official denial either. But the Egyptian government couldn't risk any more mysterious disappearances. So they prohibited him from entering the tomb for a while. Some have connected this apparent stealing to the curse of King Tut. If you've never heard of it, know that it became quite the scary tale soon after King Tutankhamun's resting place was uncovered. It claimed that anyone messing with the tomb of the boy pharaoh would face some serious bad luck. It's not all dramatic like a mummy going on an aggressive spree, but word got out that the people involved in disturbing King Tut's lair met some mysterious, untimely ends. The main untimely passing related to this supposed curse is that of George Herbert, the 5th Earl of Carnarvon. He was this British aristocrat who helped fund the search for the tomb. He passed away just a year after the tomb was opened. Now, people love to call it mysterious, but it turns out that Herbert was already in pretty bad shape health-wise when he got to Cairo, and he ended up getting taken down by a regular disease. Now, let's talk numbers. There were a lot of people linked to this tomb opening – security guards, archaeologists, and supporting staff. And sure, a few of them did pass not long after the tomb started receiving visitors. As much as we'd like this curse to be true for the sake of, you know, good storytelling, statistically, if you have a bunch of people connected to opening a tomb, you'd expect some passings just by random chance. The average lifespan for those supposedly targeted by the ancient curse was more than 20 years after the spell was supposed to kick in. Herbert's daughter even lived until the 1980s, that's half a century later. And Howard Carter himself lived until 1935, a solid 16 years after the big reveal. Some have suggested that the whole curse was nothing more than a careful PR strategy. You see, when Tut's tomb was found, Howard Carter wanted to make a priority out of keeping nosy reporters away. So he might have come up with a curse hanging over anyone entering the boy king's resting place. But what was stolen from King Tut's tomb anyway? Well, some jewelry to begin with. It might have been snatched by Howard Carter himself, according to a French specialist. He did some intensive research by looking at old pictures taken from inside the tomb back in the 1920s. He compared those images to various objects from museums and auction houses. He soon started to piece together the whereabouts of some of Tut's jewelry. First up, there's this collar that used to be on Tut's chest. It was all broken into pieces, and some parts went via Carter to the Nelson Atkins Museum in Missouri. Meanwhile, other bits ended up on a necklace owned by some unnamed people who tried to sell it in 2015 but failed. Even the Nelson Atkins Museum agrees, as they've confirmed the information on their website. Then there's a headdress piece. Some beads from it that once belonged to Tut apparently got stolen by Carter too. They were also strung into a necklace and are now being held at the St. Louis Art Museum. Another fancy collar made out of glazed ceramic magic spent some time at the Met, far away in New York. Thankfully, it was sent back to Egypt a bit over a decade ago. This seems to have been, as you'd expect by now, 
also stolen by Carter. Missing artifacts aside, King Tut still gave a ton of amazing objects that helped us learn more about this incredible ancient culture. Starting with the famous burial mask, it's this massive 21-inch gold art piece with semi-precious stones and glass paste. It weighs 22 pounds and showcases the boy Pharaoh with a long beard and a headdress with a cobra and vulture. On the back, there's this spell from an important ancient Egyptian spiritual book that's supposed to make sure it works just as well in the afterlife. Todd was also apparently a board game enthusiast. They found four board games in his tomb, some made of ivory. Archaeologists also found a pair of gold sandals, though you'd imagine they were more for show than for comfort. In fact, the pharaoh probably never wore them in his lifetime. Now, speaking of fashion items, it turns out Tut was quite the fancy ruler. They even found a mannequin in his tomb that was used to pick out, adjust, and store his outfits and jewelry. The boy king seemed to have also enjoyed some music, based on the two trumpets historians found in his tomb. Though they were played back in 1935 in a BBC broadcast, the instruments are today considered too fragile to be maneuvered. When you hear the word mummy, you might get a chill down your spine. That's because most of us associate this word with those creepy characters you've seen in some scary movies. But in reality, mummies have helped us understand a lot about ancient civilizations, their rulers, and about how people used to deal with losing their loved ones. The people most famous worldwide for their mummies are the ancient Egyptians. They believed that some sort of existence after passing away was possible, if certain conditions were met. That's why they insisted on preserving the human body through the process of mummification and placing the mummy in a furnished tomb. Kind of like giving it a fully functioning apartment of its own. Why did they believe in this? Well, because they were deeply connected to their natural environment for the most part. They saw the natural cycles around them, like how the sun rose every day, followed by the moon, or how new life was always sprouting from plants even after they had wilted away. They also believed that the powerful spirit Osiris, who represented the cycle of passing away and resurrection, played a role in this process. To prepare for the afterlife, the ancient Egyptians followed certain rituals, like mummification, which involved using materials like honey, resins, and incense to preserve the body. There's no other mummy more popular than that of King Tut. He was a young pharaoh who ruled over 3,000 years ago in Egypt. The problem with discovering ancient royal tombs is that most of such burial sites were previously robbed. People knew ancient rulers had been left with many valuable belongings, so those locations became vulnerable to thieves. When King Tut's tomb was opened in 1922, people were excited because it had not been robbed, like many other previously discovered royal tombs. That's how well hidden it was. Inside, his mummy was encapsulated in a total of three coffins, including one made of gold. The objects found in his tomb showed us what ancient Egypt was like. And studying his mummy also helped us learn about the culture and practices popular at the time when he passed away. We also learned about his family by looking at his DNA. Scientists were able to discover that he had had a disease called malaria and a problem with his foot that might have made it hard for him to walk. Ramses II was another pharaoh in Egypt who ruled for 68 years, which was quite a lot back in the day. He was known for his expansion campaigns and building projects. Many objects from his time as a ruler still exist today, including a large statue of him. Ramses II was about six feet tall and lived to be about 90 years old. After looking at his mummy, scientists concluded that he may have had a medical condition that affected his spine. Now, remember those thieves I mentioned before? They are probably the reason why Ramses II ended up in a plain coffin in a secret collection of royal mummies at Deir al-Bahari, which was rediscovered in 1881. Thankfully, archaeologists were able to identify him because his journeys had been recorded on his wrappings. The process was really tedious, too. 
In fact, in ancient Egypt, the mummification process could take a staggering 70 days to complete. A special person would say a very specific speech while delicately handling the body and drying it out using a type of salt called natron. They also used linen and resin to make the body look more lifelike and to wrap it in cloth. The tomb was equally as important for ancient Egyptians. The walls of King Tut's tomb, for example, were adorned with intricate artwork that depicted his journey to the afterlife, from his burial procession to his passage through the underworld. The ancient Egyptians believed that everyone made this journey after passing away, and they filled their tombs with items and paintings to help the person in their spiritual travels. Additionally, the walls of the tomb were decorated with spells from a special book, which contained a collection of poems that the Egyptians believed would help people reach the afterlife. And speaking of how important this journey was, people also placed food in these ancient tombs. In King Tut's tomb, archaeologists discovered 36 jars of vintage beverages and eight baskets of fruit, which were believed to be left there to help him in his journey to the afterlife. The Egyptians believed that traveling to the afterlife took a really long time, so they left a lot of supplies, such as food and water, to sustain their loved ones. Pharaohs also generally had numerous luxurious garments and beautiful jewelry in their tombs to ensure that they would have a fashionable journey. These items included various types of linen clothing, such as tunics, scarves, gloves, and headdresses, as well as a lot of gold jewelry with precious stones, like bracelets, buckles, pennants, necklaces, rings, and even precious depictions of insects for protection. Some were also deposited with fans made from ivory and ostrich feathers to keep them cool in the afterlife. Some ancient rulers were even placed in their forever apartments along with boats. For example, Pharaoh Khufu built the Great Pyramid at Giza as his tomb, and a large ship was found inside. King Tut, however, was buried with multiple boat paddles, but no actual boat. Instead, he had three chariots and numerous walking sticks made of precious materials, perhaps indicating he'd rather travel to the beyond by land, not by water. Amongst the most interesting objects found near ancient mummies are bottles of oils and perfumes. If rulers were supposed to be fashionable, why not smell nice too, right? Also, some of them had some ancient kinds of board games, most of them made out of precious materials like gold or ivory. One of those games was called Senate. It was very popular amongst the ancient Egyptians and very similar to modern day chess. The ancient Egyptians may have the most famous mummies out there, but they weren't the first to invent the procedure. In fact, it all started in South America with an ancient civilization named the Chinchorro. As far as we know today, these people were the first to mummify their loved ones that had passed away. They did it somewhere around 2,000 years before the Egyptians started their own rituals. Sure, we can tell a lot about ancient rulers by studying these mummies, but until recently, we had no idea what they really looked like during their lifetime. Not so long ago, though, some very special mummy paintings were found by archaeologists studying ancient Egyptian objects. These mummy portraits are highly detailed paintings of individuals that were made while they were still alive. Such paintings were often painted on wood, as opposed to the classical portraits we all know about, which are painted on canvas. They are known for their realism and beauty, and have even been used by researchers to diagnose diseases by comparing them to the corresponding mummies. Some of these portraits also include depictions of jewelry, which was later found on the mummies. The recent discovery of these mummy portraits in central Egypt is significant as it marks the first time in over a century that such paintings have been found. Mummies appeared all around the world naturally too. Mummification can occur without people intervening because of natural conditions like extremely cold or hot environments, places with a lack of oxygen, or accidental exposure to chemicals that preserve the body. These conditions don't allow bacteria to grow, resulting in the body remaining more or less intact. Famous Atsi was one of these mummies. We know today he was a man who lived around 5,000 years ago in Europe. But upon his discovery in the Alps in 1991, 
Austrian authorities initially believed that he was a modern mountaineer because of how well preserved the body was. However, after the Iceman was removed from the glacier, it was determined that he was actually from the Copper Age. A gruesome discovery took place in Egypt some years ago. You want to hear about it? 16 human hands, carefully buried in four eerie pits. They didn't look too much like human hands at first, since they were abnormally large. But they were. Weirdly, there were only right hands. No left hands were in sight. It turned out that it points to the practice of an ancient dark ritual. Old Egyptian art and tales talked of a ceremony where warriors would present the right hand of their adversaries as proof of victory and ask for gold in return. Egyptians believed in the afterlife, so cutting off someone's hand meant you cut off their power eternally. Guaranteeing this type of defeat was interesting to the winning party. Here, the fight was between Egyptians versus Hyksos, who lived in what was once known as Canaan. Egypt has always been the center of some history-changing findings, and some time ago, this papyrus was found. If we stretched it open, it would be just a tad bigger than the height of a skyscraper. The world's tiniest skyscraper, I mean, which is located in Wichita Falls, Texas. When humans didn't write on their notes app, they wrote on this thing, made from the medulla of a papyrus plant. Around 2,000 years ago, ancient Egyptians wrote something reminiscent of a book where they describe most of their funerary traditions and their visions of the afterlife. It's considered one of the most important texts from ancient Egypt, and is still sold in bookstores to this day. This ancient manuscript was unearthed from a chamber located just south of the Pyramid of Dozier, located in Saqqara. Oh yes, Dozier is the oldest pyramid in Egypt and not the Giza pyramids like most people think. So recently, the site of Saqqara buzzed with excited archaeologists who probably found one of Egypt's oldest complete mummies. They believe that this beautiful and well-preserved mummy was that of a wealthy man. He was discovered in a deep shaft, covered in layers of gold leaves. There are many symbols that show he was an important and wealthy man, like the band he wore on his head, the bracelet on his chest, and the fact that he was embalmed with a tunic, which was reserved for Egypt's finest. The most exciting part of the entire discovery was finding the resting place sealed with mortar, just as the ancient Egyptians had left it 4,300 years ago. Now this may sound weird, but back in 2008, archaeologists discovered a missing pyramid. Now it went missing because it deteriorated over the span of 4,000 years. Today, you can only see its base. It was a pretty important site back in ancient times. It is said that around the area of the pyramid, the ancients hosted a special type of ceremony where high priests would carry mummified remains of sacred bulls. Now, here's a fun fact. Ancient Egyptians believed that Apis bulls were earthly incarnations of the city deity of Memphis and was connected to rites of fertility. It wasn't just any Apis bull, though. They needed to be all black, with a single white mark between its horns and a bunch of very specific characteristics. They were selected by the local priests and honored until they passed away. After that, they were mummified and buried in underground galleries. Meanwhile, this missing pyramid sort of disappeared around the 1800s. It was a German archaeologist who first found it in the village of Sakura. He called it the Headless Pyramid when he first hmm. found it. But then, years after the official discovery, the desert sand came along and covered the whole thing. There were some excavations between the 19th and 20th centuries, but they weren't too systematic. That's why scientists were so thrilled when they dug an entire pyramid's base after removing the 25-foot mound of sand that was covering it. Oh, and it turns out American archaeologists are excavating a cemetery in Egypt that could contain over a million mummified bodies. So far, archaeologists have dug around 1,700 mummies. One of the main differences from other classic Egyptian mummies is that these people weren't kings and pharaohs. They were commoners that most likely lived about 1,500 years ago, when Egypt was controlled by the Roman and Byzantine empires. The name of the cemetery is cool, though. The Way of the Water Buffalo. Just in case you want to check it out on your next trip. Other than bulls and buffaloes, ancient Egyptians also liked baboons. Are you seeing a pattern here? 
In the beginning of the 20th century, archaeologists discovered a site filled with mummified baboons in a place called, guess what, the Valley of Monkeys. An animal wouldn't have been mummified if it wasn't considered important. Certain animals were more important than others, since they were linked to specific deities. Jackals were connected to Anubis, the ancient god of the afterlife, and cats were likened to the female deity Bastet. Baboons were a pretty big deal, since they were believed to be connected to Thoth, the deity of wisdom and advisor to Ra, one of Egypt's supreme deities. The archaeologists who studied these animals weren't too happy. They think these baboons were kept inside and were deprived of sunlight for most of their lives. They had extreme vitamin D deficiencies and they were poorly fed. Maybe Thoth got angry with these baboon keepers. Eh, just a guess. Since there's never a boring day for archaeologists in Egypt, they also found human mummies with golden tongues. Since Egyptians were all about the afterlife, they believed that golden tongues might help a person speak once they pass to the other side. I mean, it's a long shot, but hey, why not? Some of these mummies were placed in wooden coffins with goods, such as necklaces, pottery, golden artifacts in the shape of lotus flowers and scarab beetles, and iPhones. Eh, yeah, just kidding. A new temple was also unearthed recently in Egypt. Scientists believe it was dedicated to honor Zeus Cassios. That deity would be a cross between Zeus, the almighty Greek deity of the sky, and Mount Cassios. While digging around the Sinai Peninsula in Egypt, archaeologists spotted two pink granite columns poking out of the ground. And bingo! They believe these columns represented the temple's front gate and collapsed during an earthquake many years ago. And speaking of deities, there weren't only super serious deities. Recently, scientists unearthed a golden ring in a city south of Cairo. No, Frodo, it's not magical. It was a normal gold ring. But it had the depiction of the deity of fun, officially named Bess. This deity is often described in sacred texts as a happy chubby dwarf. Today, many tattoos we get are sort of deprived of any sense and are made of aesthetic purposes only. In ancient Egypt, though, women would get tattoos as a token of protection for childbirth. That's what scientists think, at least. Around the Nile region, scientists found some mummies that had well-preserved tattoos, which is a rarity since the skin deteriorates so easily. Two of these women tattooed their lower backs, and the drawings were simple. There were mostly pictures, including that same chubby dwarf we just talked about, Bess. He also had a side hustle as the protector of women during childbirth. Now, would you believe me if I told you ancient Egyptians invented robots? No? Well, that's because that's not entirely true. Sure, they were astronomers, mathematicians, and engineers, and somehow they also squeezed an eccentric invention into that package. An automated deity some scientists called Hathor. This wooden statue had been in the Metropolitan Museum of Art for years before someone noticed its secret. With the help of an x-ray machine, specialists discovered a mechanical operating system inside it. The pulley-like axis goes from the statue's shoulder to her left leg. When the system rotates, the statue raises and lowers her hand. Hey, pick me! Pick me! I got my hand up here! The ancient city of Taposiris Magna is hidden on the northern coast of Egypt. These days it has very little of its former glory. But what lies beneath it may hold the secret to uncovering a famous mystery. That of Cleopatra, the most memorable Egyptian queen in history. The recently discovered tunnel is also known as a geometric miracle for its time. Excavations have uncovered a 43-foot-long structure below the ground, which is partially submerged in water. Its shape and construction technique are similar to that of the Eupolinos Tunnel. Another amazing ancient discovery. This one is located in Greece and was built by excavating simultaneously from two points, aiming to have them meet in the middle. The use of math and geometry to make this construction was astonishingly precise for those days, more so since it was built near a mountain. Archaeologists that have been working on the Taposiris Magna site since 2004 believe this tunnel may lead to the lost tomb of Cleopatra. The clues they found so far seem to back up this theory. For starters, the city and its temple were built by one of Cleopatra's ancestors, Ptolemy II. All the architecture seems to indicate it was dedicated to the ancient spirit Osiris and his queen Isis. Throughout her reign, 
Cleopatra did try to associate herself with Isis, so it may be no surprise she chose this location as her final resting place. Scientists have yet to pinpoint Cleopatra's tomb, but research continues with the help of modern technology. To study this location better, archaeologists have even used a special device called ground-penetrating radar. This tool allows us to analyze what lies beneath the ground without being intrusive. Since this tunnel is so old, research needs to be done very delicately. Seeing pictures of what's underground before you start digging is incredibly useful and has been done here since 2011. Finally discovering Cleopatra's tomb may help us piece together her story, especially what might have happened during the last portion of her life, which is still surrounded by mystery. We still don't know the exact cause of her passing. Some believe she may have let herself be bitten by a poisonous Egyptian cobra. Others have suggested that she was well accustomed to toxic substances, even hiding some in her hairbrush in case she ever needed it. But that's not to say she chose to use it on herself. We do have a lot of other interesting information on Cleopatra that's equally as impressive. Like the fact that she had a stylist. Most of the images you've seen depicting this famous queen show her wearing black eyeliner. This look was put together by Ayras, a woman known to have been her personal beautician. She traced the long line from her eyes to her temples, a makeup technique still used today to enhance the eyes. Ayras was an important figure throughout Cleopatra's life, known also as her confidant and close friend. There are even theories that suggest Ayras was there by her side when she passed away. Despite her well-thought-out looks, Cleopatra wasn't as pretty as she's described. Or at least, that's what recent research has pointed out. Sure, if we look at movies and modern imagery, she's depicted as this incredibly beautiful woman with symmetrical and delicate features. However, if we look at coins showcasing her image from back in the day, her looks are rather average. Her image on the coins might have been adjusted too to make the queen look stronger in the eyes of her people. So there is no trusted source available to confirm her image, but her description in most pieces of ancient literature speaks of her other qualities, like her voice and personality, not of her beauty. Cleopatra might have been the most famous Egyptian queen to this day, but she wasn't the first choice. She did have an older sister, Berenice, that was initially supposed to take the throne. Berenice passed away before she could do that, so Cleopatra took on the role and began investing in her education. She traveled throughout the country quite frequently, so she could become accustomed to her people and their needs. She was only 18 when the responsibilities were passed down to her and immediately gained popularity because of her intelligence and education. Her taste in literature was quite good too. She was known to be a fan of Homer, the famed Greek philosopher and poet. Cleopatra loved to write as much as she loved to read. There are even claims that she wrote a book on medicine and cosmetics, but we have no evidence to this day that such work ever existed. Part of being a great leader back then meant you had to speak multiple languages. Cleopatra clearly understood that, and that's why she's rumored to have known many languages to varying degrees. Some archaeologists suggested she spoke Greek, Egyptian, and Ethiopian, as well as many Arabic dialects. She might have even spoken Latin, but there's little evidence to support this claim. She might not have had angelic looks, but Cleopatra was really careful with the way she looked, even with her diet. She was known to have enjoyed simple meals, including a variety of fish. Since she lived close to the Mediterranean Sea, it's really no surprise. As a treat, she liked to eat stuffed pigeons, which she also served to her guests. Other dishes on the menu included vegetables and fava bean soup. Fruits and nuts weren't missing from her diet either, and she was also a big fan of honey. Recently, a team of experts has even tried to recreate her famous perfume. Think of it like the ancient equivalent of Chanel No. 5. Cleopatra was known to be a fan of luxurious scents, which she believed could even influence how people treated her when they met. 
The basis of this scent is myrrh, a resin gathered from a local tree. Other ingredients added to the mixture were also found back in the day, like cardamom, olive oil, and cinnamon. The results may not be quite as delicate as the perfumes we know and use today. Its consistency was way thicker, and the scent lasted way longer. When she was at the height of her power, Cleopatra might have been the richest person in the world. Back in the day, she ruled over a territory that stretched across the Mediterranean, from modern-day Libya in the west through Egypt to Syria in the east. This is the largest territory ever ruled over by a woman. In today's currency, her worth might have been somewhere around $95 billion. The calendars we use today may have been introduced by Cleopatra herself. She presented the idea of leap years and leap days to Caesar, the Roman emperor she was known to have been close with. Taking her advice, Caesar made these adjustments part of the official Roman calendar. The ancient Egyptians already knew the year was longer than precisely 365 days. They discovered this by studying the brightest star in the sky, called Sirius, and concluded that a year is actually 365 and one quarter days long. It was Elizabeth Taylor that famously introduced Cleopatra to pop culture when she played her in the 1963 film bearing the same name. Up until that point, it was the most expensive film ever made. It was originally supposed to cost somewhere around $2 million, but ended up costing a mind-boggling $44 million. That's mostly because of script and production issues. To make this iconic movie, producers created 79 sets from scratch, as well as over 26,000 costumes for the cast. Elizabeth Taylor's Cleopatra costumes alone cost somewhere around $200,000. Thankfully for the producers, the movie made headlines and was well-received by critics, making it a box office success. A lot of people associate Cleopatra with another famous Egyptian ruler, King Tutankhamun, nicknamed King Tut. Surprisingly, apart from both of them being Egyptian pharaohs, they have nothing else in common. For starters, King Tut lived around 1,300 years before Cleopatra did and there is also no connection regarding their ancestry. Cleopatra had Macedonian Greek roots, while King Tut was a native Egyptian.